He's so good. Let's open our Bibles to Matthew's Gospel. We're going to spend a few moments today uh, looking at chapter 28. We're going to be looking at, uh, obviously, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am so happy to be home. I'm so happy to have you guys with us today. I really am. You can't imagine how last year it was so difficult for us and, and all on Easter to not be able to celebrate with our, our friends and family. And so, again, I love you guys. It's so, it's so good to see you. Praise the Lord that you're back. And uh, I hope you come back next week, okay? So beginning <laughs> at verse 1, Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 8. Now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Madeline and the other Mary came to see the tomb. Behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. So we're gathering today to celebrate the cornerstone of our faith. We're gathering to celebrate the resurrection. You know, as Christians, we generally celebrate two basic important holidays. One of those holidays, obviously, is Christmas. And Christmas is a very important holiday to us because it's a recognition of the birth of Jesus Christ. Though Christmas is important, it's not the most important holiday that we celebrate. The holiday that's most important to us believers will always be Easter. Now, why would that be true? Well, someone said Easter is important because Christianity revolves around the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If Jesus did not die for our sins, or if Jesus did not rise again after three days, then the entire hope of Christianity is based upon nothing but a lie. Christianity would be meaningless because our sins would not be forgiven. And that's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14, when he said, If Christ is not risen, our preaching is empty. Your faith is also empty. He went on in verse 17 of 1 Corinthians 15 to say, If Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. So we celebrate Easter because it's the fulfillment of God's promise that he would rescue us. All the way back in the beginning, in the book of Genesis, in chapter 3, verse 15, God had promised that Messiah would crush the head of the serpent and the serpent would bruise his heel. Well, that happened at the cross when Jesus died, and that happened when Jesus was later resurrected. So Easter fulfills the prophecies that were given concerning what Messiah would do. When you look in the Old Testament book of, of Isaiah, written over 700 years before Christ, Isaiah the prophet had prophesied concerning Messiah. In Isaiah 53, verses 2 through 6, this is what he wrote. He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised, rejected by mankind, a man of suffering, familiar with, with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he, has, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one has turned to our own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve took of that forbidden fruit. God said that in the day that they ate of it, they would surely die. But in their disobedience to God, sin entered into the world, and through sin, death itself. Paul wrote in Romans 5, 12, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, death through sin in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. 
Adam is called theologically the federal head of mankind, so his nature was given to us. He had a fallen nature we have inherited, and so he sinned, and that nature has been passed to his descendants. That's why Paul in Romans 3.10 would say, there's none righteous, no, not one. That's why Romans 3.23 would say, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And again, in the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, verse 20, the writer said, there's not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. All of us are sinners by nature. And because the wages of sin is death, Jesus took upon himself human flesh and died on our behalf. He said in Matthew 20, 28, he, the Son of Man, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life, a ransom for many. So in order to point towards the work of Messiah, God established festivals in the nation of Israel. One of those festivals is Passover. It's a time to remember Israel's deliverance from the nation of Egypt and, and their bondage. At that time, sacrificial lambs are slain, intending to point to the work of Jesus Messiah. And that's why in John 1.29, John the Baptist called Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Peter later on in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 would say, you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. So at that festival, it was at that festival that Jesus voluntarily gave up his life on the cross. And he did so voluntarily. He wasn't forced to do that. He did it of his own will. In John 10, 17 and 18, he said, my father loves me because I laid down my life that I might take it again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down, and I have power to take it again. And this command I have received from my Father. So from the beginning of his ministry to its completion, Jesus had made it clear that he would die. All the way back in John chapter 2, verse 19, in the first cleansing of the temple, Jesus said, destroy this temple. In three days I will raise it up. And John later said he spoke of the temple of his body. Throughout his ministry to his men, he made it clear, I'm going to die, but I will resurrect. We look in Matthew's gospel and see several instances where he said that. In Matthew 16, 21, he records, from that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised again the third day. In Matthew 17, 22 and 23, Jesus said, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day, he will be raised to life. And again in Matthew chapter 20, verses 17 through 19, as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside, said to them, we're going to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will turn him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. So that has been completed. Jesus at this point has been betrayed, and Jesus has gone to the cross, and Jesus has died. It is now the first day of the week. He's been crucified, he's died, and he's been buried. And all of this had occurred on Friday, but it is now Sunday. It says in verse 1, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn. It's Sunday morning. Sabbath has come, and Sabbath has gone. Women got up early. They made their way to the tomb. Matthew gives us the names of two of the women, but Mark gives us more information. In Mark's gospel in chapter 16, he said, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Madeline, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. You see, according to the Jewish method of calculation, three days have passed. The Jews considered reference to a day as meaning any part of that day. And Jesus was buried on Friday afternoon. His body was in the tomb all of Saturday and into Sunday morning for three days. He had prepared his disciples for what was going to occur. But as is common, the disciples did not fully understand what he had said to them. One of the things you might want to remember, it's a great blessing for us to remember, is most lessons that God gives to us are repeated often, very often over our lifetime. He gives us a lesson, we learn a bit of it, gives us a second lesson, the same kind of lesson, we learn more and more, and over time, we actually grow to understand his ways. 
And I'm thankful that God doesn't say things just one time, but he reminds me often. And here in verse 1, the women have come to the tomb early. They're there to complete the burial. There were two men, Joseph and Nicodemus, and they had lavishly buried Jesus. But for these women, that wasn't enough. And so what this is is a picture of loving devotion, but it's also a picture of unbelief. They may have followed him as he carried his cross. They remained throughout his crucifixion and his death. In John 19, 25, it says, There stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Madeline. So they had been with Joseph. They had been with Nicodemus when Jesus was buried, and they've returned in order to complete the burial process. And as they walk, they're dealing with the concern. Mark 16, 3 says, they asked, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? You see, the stone was very heavy. It weighed between four and 6,000 pounds. It's a wheel on an incline, and it would be rolled down the incline and lodge into a section that had been carved out. It wouldn't have been possible for the women to move the stone alone. Now, that is a touching picture, but in reality, it's an activity that's rooted in unbelief because they're expecting to find a dead body, the dead body of Jesus in a tomb. Again, as is so often, they were concerned about something unnecessarily. They didn't have to move the stone. The stone had already been moved. But under the duress of incredible grief, they forgot what Jesus had said. He had consistently told them this is going to happen, but they forgot again Many of the lessons the Lord intends to teach require repetition. The theoretical and intellectual is intended to become the experiential. And so the stone, according to verse 2, was moved, and the tomb is open. An earthquake occurred when an angel had descended from heaven, and the angel had rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. Verse 3 tells us that his countenance was like lightning, his clothing as white as snow. So it's a picture of radiance. It's a picture of purity. It's a picture of holiness. And when this happened, verse 4, the guards shook for fear of him. They became, it says, like dead men. It's interesting that the word in verse 4, shook, is a word that is what is called the same root word as the word earthquake. They were shaking as if they were in an earthquake, even though there wasn't, wasn't an earthquake. And these men, by the way, uh, one commentator pointed out about these men here, these soldiers, they were 16 commandos. They made up what would be called a security unit. They were Rome's, if you will, Delta Force. These were not guys who were just hanging around with pot bellies. These were guys who were, they were the baddest of the bad. And they were very skilled as they were skilled in warfare, but they were no match for just one of God's angels. And so when they saw him, they became afraid. They shook for fear and became like dead men. They fainted dead away. But, verse 5, the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. Now, they didn't express fear. It doesn't say here in the, in the, in the text that they showed fear, but the angel knew that they were afraid at the sight of the glory. They, it would cause them to tremble. And so he has to calm the women down. He has to soothe them. They're startled. They need comforting. And the guards had every reason to be afraid. But the women, he says, you don't need to fear because you're not enemies of Jesus. You're his friends. You're his followers. And so he says in verse 5, I know that you seek Jesus. Now, again, they obviously thought Jesus' body would still be in the tomb. In Luke 24, verse 5, Luke gives us more insight. It says, in their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? Luke speaks of two angels. That's why he says the men. They had the appearance of men, and that's why he said that. And then he goes on in verse 6 to say this. He's not here, for he's risen. Notice, as he said. In Mark 16, verse 6, it reads, don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He's risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. So here you go. How does he comfort them? 
Where does my comfort come from? Where does yours come from? Many people's comfort come from various sources. But our comfort is to come from the word of God. What comforts me? What strengthens me? Isn't the cheerful words of encouragement that friends might give to me. And I appreciate every cheerful word of encouragement that I receive. I'm very grateful for it. But, uh, but uh, you're going to make it, uh, you know, uh, stiff upper lip and all of that. So that doesn't comfort me. It's going to be okay. That doesn't comfort me. What has comforted me in my times of trials and the times of fears that I've had has always been the word of God. It's always been what God has said. And that's what he's doing. He's comforting them by God's word. One of the worst things that we can get into the habit of is not reading God's word. And a lot of believers, unfortunately, have... have uh, departed from the reading of the Word of God. It's the Word of God that gives you light. It gives you encouragement. It gives you strength. It gives you guidance. It gives you, it builds your faith. It nourishes your soul. It, and it gives you comfort and peace in times of struggle and trial. And so we need to hold fast to the Word of God. And he says it. He's risen as he said. In Luke 24, 6 through 8, it says, He's not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. There are times when I have had difficult times. So many. I've been following the Lord for a long time. And, and where has my strength come from? It has come from God's word. It's come from reading the word and, and looking at his promises. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you always. I will provide strength for you. I will bring you comfort. I, I, I'm with you. I raise you up. I will hold you fast. There are so many things the Lord has said over, over time. And it comes through his word because I can trust God. I can trust what he has to say. In Numbers 23, 19, the Bible says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise? and not fulfill. And so the Bible's telling us he's alive. He is alive. He has risen. I, I remember I've said this before, but it comes to mind even as I see this, you know, this passage. I, I remember how one time when we were in Israel and uh, my daughter Anna at that time was, I think, seven years old. Some of you will remember this story, but it, it, it's imprinted in my heart that we went to the, the tomb, the historic site of where Jesus had been laid, and, and we went into the tomb. And as we went into the tomb, uh, my daughter, my little girl, was the last one to go in, my Anna. She was seven. And uh, as she was standing there waiting, I, my wife and I stepped away and gave her her private time to walk into the tomb. I'll never forget how my little girl went in for a minute, and then she came out. And when she came out, she had her arms raised like this, and she was only seven. She raised her arms, and she yelled out, He's not here. He's not here. And we all cheered, yeah, because he's alive. He has risen. He is no longer in the tomb. He's our Savior, and he, he made the promise, and he kept it. Now, there's a fly here grabbing me, and I'm going to have to take his wings off. I hope you guys don't mind. So it says in verse 6, Come see the place where the Lord lay. I want, to, I want to develop this with you for a moment. Come see the place where the Lord lay. Come and see where the Lord of glory was. But remember, he's not here. This is an invitation. It's an invitation for them to come and see that Jesus is who he is. Jesus is who he said he is. The women are not only being invited to come and see an empty tomb. The fact is, they're being invited to come to the one who is no longer in that tomb. Now, as I was reading and I read the words, come, come see, I thought of another place where people are invited to come. In Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30, Jesus said this, come to me. All you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. 
I read something recently that a great preacher of another day, Charles Spurgeon, I read something that Charles Spurgeon once noted. Spurgeon said that in the four Gospels, there are 89 chapters of biblical text. In the 89 chapters, there is only one place Jesus tells us about his own heart. And it's found here in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, when Jesus issues an invitation for people to come to him. One author said that in the Gospels, we read of his birth. We read of his ministry. We read of his disciples and we read of his travels. In the Gospels, we read of his prayers. We read of his disputes. We read his teachings. We get a glimpse at his prayer life. In the Gospels, we read of his arrest. We read of his death. We read of his resurrection. But in only one place do we ever read about him opening up his heart to us. And Jesus, when he revealed his heart, and some people need to hear this today, when Jesus revealed his heart, he didn't reveal an unfeeling heart. He did not reveal a harsh heart. He did not reveal a demanding heart. He revealed a heart that is gentle and lowly. You see, in the Bible, the heart is not always used to speak of emotions. The heart is most often used to speak of the core of our being. That's why we're commanded to love God with all our heart. In Mark 12, 30, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. We're commanded to love God with everything within us from the core. And the heart speaks of the core. It's the center of our being. That's why we're to guard it. Proverbs 4, 23, above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. And so Jesus is revealing to us a heart, a heart that is welcoming, a heart that is loving, a heart that is gentle, a heart that is humble. He's revealing this heart to us, and that's what he's speaking about. He says that he's gentle. When it says gentle, it simply means that he's, he's, he's meek, he's humble. He's not harsh. He is not one who overreacts. He, he isn't impatient. So he speaks, I have a gentle heart. He says that I have a lowly heart. The word lowly in this verse speaks of being someone who has been pushed down in life. It's a picture of someone who's been pushed down. It's like what Isaiah 53, 3 said. He's despised, rejected by mankind, a man of suffering, familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He's despised. We, we held him in low esteem. He's saying, I understand you. Jesus didn't come for the perfect people. Jesus came for the sinner. And he's saying to the sinner, you can come to me. You don't have to be afraid of me. You don't have to fear me. I'm not the one coming right now in fire. That will come in the book of Revelation in the second coming. But in his first coming, he's saying to us, you can come to me because I'm gentle. You can come to me because I'm humble. You can come to me because I'm welcoming. You can come to me because I love you. And I'm inviting you to come to me. That's what Jesus Christ did. And he's saying, I'm lowly in heart. And so he's simply saying, and this is so beautiful, when he says, I'm lowly, he's saying, I'm accessible. Though he's God in human flesh, though he is the Lord of glory, he invites us to come. Now, who is it that he's inviting? Who is he saying, come to me? Who is he speaking to? All he says who labor and are heavy laden. All of you who are trying so hard to find peace. All of you who are burdened, all of you who are weighed down, you see at the core of his being, he's saying, I'm gentle and I'm lowly and I'm the one who can give you rest. Listen, our sins are never too great for his loving grace and power to forgive. Our way of life is never so far gone that he cannot redeem and transform. He does not just meet us in our place of need. He lives in our place of need. Just as last Wednesday, we had visitors here to, for our Wednesday night study. There were men who came from a ministry, you turn for Christ. Many of those men, all of those men, have placed themselves into this home, a rehab home, because every one of them 
have failed miserably, and they know it. And so they came to visit, and they came to church because these are men who are finding that Jesus Christ doesn't reject them. If you look within yourself, even at this moment, and you think about the life that you've lived, I might have some perfect people here. You never know. I guess all of us can admit to be failures at one time or other. All of us can say, I have failed. I have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I haven't lived a perfect life. We all can admit that, I would hope. What are you going to do with your sin? Who's going to forgive it? How's it going to be that you're going to have peace? How can you have peace? How can you know for certain that you're forgiven? We have so many testimonies in this church of, of, of people who were used by God, who were turned around from one life and, and, and went into a new one. We have a young man that uh, a couple of weeks, two or three weeks ago, some of you were with us and you'll remember, we mentioned him. His name is Halberth, and Halberth came from Mexico, from, from the Yucatan area, and and Halbert uh, had come to church, and, and uh, Halbert, you know, had gotten into the United States in the way that many do. He just came, and he stayed. And he came to church here a few years ago. He was invited, apparently, and he came to church. And Halbert came, and he heard the gospel, and he gave his heart to Christ. And as Halbert stayed and, and began to learn about the things of the Lord, God began to move on Halbert's heart and said to him, go back to Mexico. Go back to Mexico. And Albert did. He got up and he went to Mexico. And he started a little Bible study in the village he's from. And while he was there, some kids began to come to the Bible study. Well, it's only 450 people in this village. But he's got a good group of kids, 40 or 50 children coming for Bible study. They begin to bring their parents. Now the numbers of kids is growing and the parents are beginning to show up. So Halbert... Uh, is talking to us and says, you know, I could sure use some help because we don't have much resources here. Can you help? And we mentioned it to this church, to many of you. We said, listen, if you want to give, and we didn't take an offering. We didn't say the Halberth Fund. We just said, if you want to give, please do. It's going to cost $25,000 to build a building so he can hold church services. And this church gave $30,000 to build that church to build that church. You see, when you're, when you're touched, when you're touched by the Lord and your life is changed and you have a purpose, then you take that to others. You come and see, and you see that he's alive and he transforms you, and then he sends you and uses you. And, and Halbert knew that. I know that. Many of you know that. Your sins are never too great for his grace. Never forget that. And his blood is capable of washing you clean from every single stinking sin you have ever committed. And his power can transform you into a brand new person. That's what he did with me. That's what he's done with many of us. Every one of us, if we had an opportunity to give our testimony, to say this is where I really was, not the sanitized one that we tell other people, the real one, the one that only you and God know, Every one of us know that we are like filthy rags compared to the righteousness of God. But what did he do? He took you from the miry clay and he put you on the solid rock, Jesus Christ. And he transformed you because our Savior lives and he lives and sets us free. And he welcomes us. He says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. My love and my grace, Jesus would be saying, are capable of, of transforming a life. And that's why we came to him. And that's why I invite every person who's listening right now to come to him. In Hebrews 4.16, the writer said, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. And so Jesus said, come. Come to me. And the angel said, Come and see, and after you see, do something else. In verse 7, go quickly, tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. Go quickly, 
tell the disciples. And they're, these disciples that are being spoken to, by the way, are in mourning, particularly the apostle Peter, because Peter had denied the Lord. So go and tell them. Bring this news to them and do so quickly because it's going to serve them. It's going to give to them comfort. It's going to give to them peace. So go tell them. These words are going to strengthen them. Later on, we know that the Lord Jesus Christ has to bring a word of reconciliation to the apostle Peter, for Peter had denied the Lord terribly three times in the same night. And the Lord had to bring him to himself and had to reconcile because Peter was brokenhearted. He was the one who had said on that night before Jesus died, he had said, though all were to forsake you and flee, I will never do it. I'll die for you. And yet, three times, he committed the, the sin of rejection, the sin of denial, three times. And the Bible tells us on the third time that he did that, that Jesus was being led past him. And Peter said, I don't know the man, and looked up, and, and Jesus was passing by. And, and Jesus looked at him, and he looked at Jesus, and he was crushed within, Peter was, and, and he wept bitterly, the Scripture says. A broken man. And Jesus said to him, do you love me? And he said, I do. Feed my sheep. Tend my lambs. Peter, I know what's in you. I know that you have a heart to desire to do the right thing. The will was present. The ability to perform that which you desired is not. That's why you need me. I'm not rejecting you. I will strengthen you. I will strengthen you. And the same man who denied knowing the Lord ultimately gave his life up for that same Lord because he had been restored and he had been filled with the power of the Spirit. And that's what God does. And the Bible makes it very, very clear very clear that we're to speak concerning this. And notice verse 8. They went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, ran to bring his disciples' word. So there's a mingling of fear. It's, it's an awe and rejoicing. Fear because they'd been in the presence of a mighty angel and joy because Jesus is alive. And what does this do? Well, it provokes them. They leave the tomb quickly. They ran to tell the disciples who were around uh, a half mile or so away from the tomb. And they told them. And as painful as this was, they were able to see the purpose of it. He died in order to secure salvation. He paid the price on the cross, but he was resurrected to show us that he has power over death. Listen, you don't have to be afraid of dying. I'm not saying go and jump in front of a car, but you don't have to fear death. Why? Because death has been conquered by life. Jesus Christ gives us life, and that more abundantly. There's something worse than COVID. There's something worse than that. We have forgotten. The church itself in many places has forgotten. There's something worse than COVID. That which is worse than COVID is dying without Jesus. That's worse than COVID. Jesus took upon himself my sin, your sin, so that he could give to me life. He's imputed to me, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, the righteousness of God in him. I can stand before the Lord. I can come boldly before the throne of grace and obtain mercy and help in my time of need because I have admitted I am a sinner and I need help. I'm a sinner and I need forgiveness. I'm a sinner. I need you. I can't make it on my own. I can't do it in my own strength. I'm not good as a person, but he is. See, we celebrate Easter because we are sinners who've been saved by grace. The church shouldn't walk around all haughty and arrogant. Of all people, we ought to be the most humble because we know what we've been and we know what God can do. And when you know that, that helps, helps you to have humility so you don't arrogantly point fingers at people. We remember that the finger we're pointing at somebody, there are three pointing back at me. And because we're aware of that, 
We speak with humility, and we actually cry to people and say, please receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, because I want you to be in heaven. I want your sins forgiven. I want you to have joy. I don't want you to live in fear anymore. I want you to have that relationship with God. And that's why I told that to my dad. And I said, Daddy, I don't want to be in heaven without you. And that's why my father gave his heart to Christ, because he knew that God changed his sinful son and that God could change him. And my father gave his heart to the Lord, my mom and others, and over these years, I've seen many who've opened their hearts and said, God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. It takes humility and it takes honesty and it takes an awareness of your need and it takes faith that Jesus Christ is who he said he is. So the invitation remains, come, come see the place where he lay. Come and be aware of the one who died for you, who no longer is there because he's alive and he's alive and ever lives to make intercession for you. Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, we do not worship a dead teacher. We worship a living Savior. And that's what Easter is all about. <laughs>